Hi, I'm Leighton Moreland, and the February What's Neat show starts right now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Caboose, sharing our passion for trains since 1938. This is the What's Neat Show for February 2018. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month we've got a great lineup. First of all, Jason Quinn comes by and shares with us his techniques for weathering boxcar roofs with both acrylics and oil paints. Gerald Style shows us his beautiful ON30 layout this month, built in a shadow box type design. The scenery is absolutely beautiful. Kevin Rubel shares with us his home layout, a 2,000 plus square foot layout with great plans for designing. It's in the initial stages and we'll follow this up in future episodes as progress goes along on that layout. Stephen M. Conroy shares with us some gorgeous drone footage from Southern California, whereas all of the modeling ideas for what we want to model can generally be found in this type of footage. We also build an N-scale layout this month, whereas the whole layout is modular, but it would be held together with magnets. It's a concept that I really wanted to try, and we put it through its paces this month on What's Neat. And with that, that's the lineup for this February 2018 What's Neat. For this layout construction segment of What's Neat, now you've seen in past What's Neat videos where I've made various types of lift out sections for my model railroad layout using magnets to hold the sections into place and that has worked very well. Now I'd like to know can you build a layout and actually hold the layout together with magnets? Now what do I mean by that? What I'd like to do is take a piece of two inch foam, cut it up in such a size that I can get an oval end scale layout out of it. I'd like it to be in four sections and I'd like it to be able to fit on top of a tabletop and look very nice and finished but at the same time, I want to hold the four sections together with these magnets. These, what they sometimes refer to as super magnets, but you can get these from uh, the Home Depot or various hardware stores. They're relatively inexpensive, but these things can hold a lot. So the theory is, build an end scale modular layout. Don't really focus on the top scenery. Just make sure the track lines up and everything fits together and the polarities of the magnets all match to where the wood can just pop together these modules that we're about to build. So that's the first thing that I'd like to talk about. Then I'd like to take it a step further. I'd like to see if this is a concept that actually could be used on a modular layout, something that you would set up at a train show at a convention center. Now to do that, I've picked up two of these magnet tools that the Home Depot sells for around $10 a piece. And what these do, these are great for picking up screws and nails around your yard after you have an outside construction job or a roof is put on your home. These work good for that. But my theory is they're pretty darn strong magnets. Why couldn't we take something like this, since they're inexpensive, 10 bucks a piece for a joint, I think would be pretty good for a connection, and connect two modular layouts together with this. Embed the plastic somehow into the woodwork where you'll then have a setup where I think it'll be pretty strong. And these magnets can hold darn near 30 pounds. And I think, here's 20 right here. I think that if you put that much weight on something like that, even with clamps and bolts the old fashioned way, if you get a 30 pound bump on a module, you're probably gonna hear wood splitting. So the theory is 30 pounds would be the maximum for using for the test for this subject. But what I'm gonna do is build this into two eight foot modules, take them outside, twist them around, and see how this turns out. So that's this segment that we're starting. Let's see how this entire thing turns out next. 
I started the project by drawing various size ovals onto a sheet of foam until I was satisfied with a minimum radius of about 14 inches, which would then fit on top of the round table that I have in the studio, measuring a total of about 3 feet wide by 4 feet 4 inches long. This will be cut into two sections forming curved ends, whereas I could make 8 foot straight sections to length to lengthen the layout and create a four section layout into the future. To make a tool which would perfectly square up the sides of the layout, I cut two sides and applied self stick sandpaper, about 80 grit to a steel square block and rubbed this new tool around the sides of the layout, feathering the curves smooth and perfectly squaring up the sides of the layout. Using blue masking tape to represent the track placement, I carved the track slash ballast profile with a bent horse rasp. Working my way around the entire layout and following this up with a Stanley Shoreform planer, creating really nice topography on both sides of the track. I removed the tape and sealed the entire layout with brown latex paint. I then cut the two sections in half at the center of the oval, creating a two-part layout base to which we could then add middle sections and make this layout any size that we want. To create a solid surface to mount the magnets, I set my router to three quarters of an inch depth using a three quarter inch router bit. I then guided the ends of the layout along the router's fence, cutting a straight groove into the ends of the foam, which would then be laid in with wood boards. I cut one by four pine boards into three quarter inch square stock, and I cut these to the exact width of the modular sections. Then using water and Gorilla Glue, I secured these wood pieces into the ends of the module, into the grooves, flush with the foam. I put weights on top of this as the glue expanded and cured, so the ends of the foam would not rise up and deform unevenly. Using the same process, I embedded small 3 quarter inch blocks into the curved sides of the layout to which we will attach the oak plywood sides. I soaked a 2 inch strip of oak quarter inch plywood in water. I sprayed water onto the curved foam surface and applied a few lines of Gorilla Glue, then proceeded to wrap and staple the plywood into place all the way around the outsides of each layout section. After cutting the plywood flush with the ends of the layout, I quickly set up bar clamps to hold the layout together as the plywood's tension wants to pull the use sections of foam wider, up to an inch, so the bar clamps prevent this. The plywood's tension stops as soon as the glue cures, keeping everything dimensionally stable. I repeated the same process to wrap the insides of the layout with wood, this time using 1 16th inch strip oak plywood cut into 2 inch long strips. After the glue cured, holding the wood sides into place, I used a flush cutting cabinet laminate trimmer to contour the tops of the plywood to match the foam's topography perfectly, all the way around the layout on all sides. I sanded the wood sides with fine 150 grit sandpaper. Then I stained the sides with red oak stain and of course three coats of polyurethane sanded in between coats with water to create a smooth glass like finish. Now to place the magnets on the end of the dioramas, I'm using this simple circle template here and I figured out what size circle was the exact diameter of our magnet here, which turned out to be this third hole down. And what I'm doing is I'm going to take this template, and this is an 11 16th size hole, and I moved it in one and a half inches centered on the 1x4 
material that I've got in here, the dimensional lumber material, and I drew a circle right there where the magnet would go. And I drew a matching identical circle, one and a half inches in center, on each one of these halves. So I've got it drawn on both halves. So what I'm going to do now is I've taken a Dremel router attachment to my Dremel here, and I've got it set to the exact same depth as the magnets. I've already pre-tested it on this piece of wood here, and the magnet's in very flush. So all I've got to do in theory is just simply take the router and make the circular indentation, the hole, into each end where the magnets are going to go, and this should just pop right together. I found it was best to router the diameter of the circle in the wood just a little larger than the magnets to give a little bit of play, ensuring that the magnets would line up automatically during the gluing process. I mixed a small amount of 5 minute epoxy and placed this into the magnets carved out holes. I then placed two stacked magnets into the first hole, ensuring the correct polarity. I then filled the adjoining modules hole with some more 5 minute epoxy. I pushed the two modules together and upon pulling them apart the magnets remained in place in their holes, prospectively each one. I wiped off the excess glue and placed a paper towel between the two sections so that they would not stick together as a glue set. I then pushed them back into place and let things set up. I put a weight on top of this joint until the glue fully cured. I installed all eight magnets to the two halves of the layout in the same manner. I then started laying microengineering code 55 and scale flex track, carefully bending it slowly around the 14 inch radius curve, working it and just working it gently so that I would have perfect track. I then soldered the track sections together with rosin core solder using Atlas and scale rail joiners. I glued the track into place with DAP Quick Seal Plus using a painter's knife. Now this glue dries permanent, fast, and clear. It is paintable, which ensures the fact that the ballast will stick to it. It also remains just a little bit flexible, allowing the track to breathe during the seasonal temperature changes. I weighed the track down while this adhesive dried. I cut the track between the two sections with a Dremel cutoff disc. I then pulled the two sections apart for the very first time and proceeded to join them back together again. It was a perfect connection and the rails lined up just right. As I tested it further by rolling this end scale rail box boxcar across the joint. The scenery on the layout started with an even layer of sifted backyard dirt over the entire scene. I followed this up with fine sifted limestone, which acted as end scale ballast. I used an artist brush to work this evenly around the ties and in between the rails to form a realistic looking track profile. I added Woodland Scenics medium and light green ground foam to the scene just to give a little color. I then glued everything into place with one bottle of Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement sprayed through a fine spray bottle, wetting the entire scene. Now while the scene was still wet, I added some static grass in various areas for just a little bit of added texture, and this stood up straight and stuck in the glue. After everything was dry, I cleaned the rail tops with an abrasive track cleaner and proceeded to test a locomotive around the layout. The track work was smooth, it was level, the locomotive ran real smooth and nice across all of the joints. Everything so far worked just perfect. Now, to test the strength of the magnet's joint further, I joined the two layout sections together and then I slid them around on a tabletop to see if they would pull apart and everything held up. I then proceeded to pick up the entire layout, letting it swing and hang. And this proves the concept of holding a layout together with magnets as a very feasible idea.
And so with that, the end scale layout using magnets, the concept works very well. The next time on What's Neat, we're gonna follow up with part two, where we're gonna try the same technique for an HO scale layout, where it'll actually be held together with these magnets. So with that, that ends this segment of layout construction using magnets to hold together a layout on What's Neat. Hi, I'm Joe Weiss, and you're watching What's Neat with Ken Patterson. On this segment of What's Neat, we're going to solve the mystery of the boxcar roof. All right. With my esteemed associates, Mike Buddy and Daniel Coombs. Yes, sir. All right, guys. Boxcar roofs. Just... It's hard to get a good look at box car. It is. Mike, you're a weathering yeah. guy, and Daniel, you're learning. I'm just mm -hmm. beginning, so it's, 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 it's show me how it's done. It's hard to do. I want to see yeah. how it's done. But it's not hard to do. Okay, we're going to talk about galvanized roofs. And um, a galvanized roof on this uh, tangent car here, we have um, the original silver. Then we have the oxidized galvanization, which is lighter in color. And then down here we have the test sample of the color, which isn't right. So you don't want to use the lighter color. Use something a little bit darker like this here. And what we're going to do first off is now that our roof is uh, faded out, mm -hmm. we're going to get a little bit of black pan pastel and just lightly brush that on. And you're just wanting to catch the areas to kind of highlight them. So, you know, oh, so it highlights like the cracks yep, or the yep. seams in the this is okay. Think of this like a layer cake or building a lasagna. Right. You got layers Layered here. All right. So. Now you're dry brushing. Basically we're dry brushing powders Oils on. or oh, pow powders. This is, this okay. is powders. Yeah. Yeah. They're actually pan pastels. And the, this base coat was acrylic. Was acrylic, right. yes sir. We'll actually be using several different mediums to okay. do this today. But you just kind of want to scrub this in. Oh, to get, I could, I could see it now. That mm -hmm. effect right mm -hmm. there. Okay, and this is where you're going to want to pull out your prototype pictures. But what we're going to do here is we're going to use acrylic burnt umber. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a nice brown color. We're going to stick that on our palette there, and what we're going to do is we're going to come in and randomly splotch this roof. So just. Yep. This is where you kind of want to pay attention to prototype photos. But since I've done a couple of these, I kind of have an idea of what they look like. Okay. Okay. But if you've never done one before, please find a photo to help you out. Now, do you want to kind of keep a, kind of a steady hand, but at, but at the same time, just, yeah, putting splotches it in? It really doesn't matter to have a steady hand, because okay. random's the name of the game here. Yeah, it okay. doesn't have to be perfect. So we'll concentrate on these two panels here for the demonstration, but this will be um, used basically throughout the whole roof. Like I said, you just, kinda, you just kind of want it, you want it random, but you don't want it to look like a paintbrush did it. That's the name of the game. Okay. Now sometimes, like the embossed part of a panel will rust, and the whole row of panels will have the same uh, pattern of rust on them because I guess they've been taken off the same yep. pallet load or whatever. But that's another thing you can do. Some box cars, the whole roof is this color. Right. That's why you need to pay attention to your photos because mm -hmm. these roofs have infinitely different, different. amounts right. of weathering and replacement panels and damaged panels. Yep. So we're gonna call this one here, for the most part, pretty good for demonstration purposes. That does look a little bit blotchy. Yeah, we kinda, we add just a little bit more in here. Just something like this right here. That actually looks pretty good. Just something like that. It doesn't look like much now, but the magic will happen soon. Mm -hmm. We're gonna use a heat gun to dry this acrylic paint fast, so I would not suggest this. You do it at home. This is for TV only now, folks. KP TV. Yeah. Don't do what I'm doing. So you normally use a hair dryer to do this? I normally let it set. 
because I have time. But since we're uh, now, you know that dryer gets very hot. You oh yeah, melt that. It will most certainly melt this. And we don't want this because yeah. it's a forty-eight dollar freight car. You want a regular blow dryer? <laughs> well, no, we're done with that now. Okay, so that's dry. We're done. Okay, we're done with the acrylics. Okay. We're now going to switch over to. Um, Let's get a couple different browns here. Now see, this is where I get worried because I think of oil paints as if you mess up, you know, again, like an amateur like me, because I, I did paint some cars with acrylics, wash it out, but with oils, you know, still, you know, so you could still use. Uh, All is not lost. Spares. But I'm yeah. going to watch you and see what you do so I can feel more comfortable about it using oils. So. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to create the rust bleed off of the rust we just put on. The rust we just put on mm -hmm. simulates heavy rust and this what we're going to do next is going to simulate the lighter rust or the rust streaking from the water and stuff rolling mm -hmm. on the roof and we're going to do that with burnt sienna oil paint i like windsor newton paint but you can buy whatever you like it does look a little bit rusty color yep it's a reddish brown yeah but i mean it still brings on that rust appearance so what we're going to do is uh we're gonna kind of come in just inside the brown areas here and oil paints go a long long way so don't overdo this we're gonna do this here just kind of going in and out of our dark brown acrylics like that there come back in you don't want like I said you don't want too much so you just like lightly dotting it around yep basically okay. just a light little dab a dab will do you all right around the edges of the darker paint yep right because the darkest uh, paint is the oldest rust that's right and once you're to this point I'm going to take, you can use a uh, turbinoid or I use MIG brand products from, I guess it's a ammo by MIG Jimenez and I use his odorless thinner to do this with, but like I said, turbinoid will work too. Mm -hmm. And first off, I'm going to clean out the brush. It doesn't have to be super clean, but I don't want it having a ton of paint right. because it'll, Go it'll overpower it. Like you said, yeah. So we want to start with a clean brush. We want a brush that's pretty well loaded with thinner. What we're going to do now is we're going to come in here, got a little bit too much thinner on there, and work these areas. You see that bleeding? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Now what is that? Is that just spreading it out to make that's, it more that's blotchy? Spreading, that's spreading it out, and it's adding the effect of the light rust. Oh my gosh, I, I can kind of see it coming to shape now. Mm -hmm. And then that's all you got to do. What? And that's just clear water, right? No, this is odorless thinner okay. or turpenoid. Like mineral spirits, you know. Uh, oh, you can use mineral spirits? Okay. Yeah, anything that, that will thin oil paint. See, the reason we used acrylics to begin with is this thinner will not touch the acrylics. Exactly. How come? Because there are two different types of paint. They're totally differently. One's, uh, one's water solvent and the other is uh, solvent based. Okay. Yep, and they're very different and they won't interact with each other. Wow, that's looking real nice. Real rusty. Boom, mm -hmm. done. Just continue that the rest of the roof this is going to take a while to dry. Oil paints always do, and the thinner takes a while to dry. Right. Sure. So finish this roof, and I would let it sit probably a week, and then come back and dull coat it. I tell you what, thank you very much, Jason. I... What's it look like finished? Have you got some samples I here? I certainly yeah, do. do. I actually have four samples. Sorry, Daniel. I just walked <laughs> over you. I apologize. Was... What were you going to say, Daniel? Well, what I was going to say is, well, thanks for showing me, and I guess yeah. I'll have to do all my Pacific Fruit, exp well, prototypical standards, uh, see what I can, but yeah, I'll give it a yep. shot. And you've achieved this using the same process the that same you just process. showed us. It just shown. It's all different. Now, if, if you don't mind me. You can touch me, yeah, you're good. Okay. This Lehigh Valley that looks very much. Yes. 
like. And with the base coat of the lighter gray, it looks like the, the, the galvanized roof has oxidized okay. you know, before it started to rust. You so. know, we've also got Dave Sheehan here watching us. Hi, Dave. <laughs> Hi. Isn't Talk this in. amazing when you watch these guys weather like this? It's, it's an art. And it's just, yeah, I mean, guys, this is what everybody wants to do is learn how to oil paint weather. Mm -hmm. And we know Mike Buddy sort of introduced it to me back in the late 80s through the articles we did in Rail Model Journal. Yeah. And, and now, Jason, you've done nothing but perfected the process on what I've seen you do on this roof. Yes. And like you say, it's just a matter of working all the way across until you get the top finished just the way you want it to be, right? That's right. And... Like I said, it looks really intimidating, but you saw it here. It's not hard to do. It just takes time. It's very simple. So uh, I think with that, guys, if you're good with questions, that finishes our segment of uh, what's yeah. neat. Right. Well, thanks for being here. Yeah. Like Daniel yeah. started to say. <laughs> you guys are very welcome. Yeah, that's that's cool, man. I like that. For this segment of What's Neat, I'm with Gerald Stiles in Littleton, Colorado, looking at his beautiful ON30 layout. I'm telling you, Gerald, this is an absolutely gorgeous model. Can you tell us a little bit about the size and to give us some background on your layout? Sure. Um, my layout is ON30. It's called the Termite and Tarantula Railroad. Uh, it was just featured in the ON30 annual for this year. Um, it was also on tour for the National Narrow Gauge Convention this year. Uh, the layout is a like double-decker layout. Uh, some of the track is hand-laid, some of the turnouts are hand-laid, some of it's flex track and stuff right out of the box. Most of the structures are all scratch-built. It's in an area that's probably about 500 square feet. Uh, I've been working on it since about 2001, uh, and I've also moved sections of it from when I lived in Texas to Colorado and just kept building away. Uh, of course, the railroad's never finished. I don't want it to be finished because then I won't have any fun. Now, I see you've got a lot of brass on this layout. It looks like you've got some Bachman models on this layout as uh, well. Yes, a lot of my equipment is uh, Bachman ON30, but it's heavily modified. I've added, you know, extra details or totally redid, you know, cabs with brass PSC parts and because I don't, I don't want my stuff to look like everybody else's stuff and right, I want to and make it, it look real. It looks fantastic. Yeah. You were telling me that roundhouse over there, I've, I'm showing you roll by footage right now, the roundhouse, it's just beautiful. You said that was a kit you manufactured. Right, yeah, I did the roundhouse. It was a kit that I produced for my company, Firebox Models. It's really for a couple nice. years. It's limited. Is gorgeous on it. Yeah, thank you. Now you were talking about the whack-a-mole area. Tell us about that. Right, yeah, that's my prairie dog town. Uh, it's, it's a little animated scene uh, that is actually um, controlled with little magnet pistons that oppose each other and make the little prairie dogs go up and, and down. And they go up and down, and that's and it's like totally your random. Dog is there your dog? Yeah, Einstein is I there found, watching? Yeah, I found a little uh, figure that I painted to look like uh, In fact, dog, Einstein, Einstein is right here at our feet. Einstein right. is the most beautiful animal I've ever seen. Ed, can you shoot me Einstein here? <laughs> Isn't this a beautiful animal? And they let this beautiful puppy run around at the caboose. Oh yeah, he's with me at work quite often. So that's really neat. Yeah. Let's walk around and look at some more things on your layout. Let's just walk this way. Ed, can you follow us? Because yes. this is just gorgeous. Now, you've got these birds flying up here. Right. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, the birds are from a gaming figure from Reaper's Miniatures. I just painted them and cut it. They were like in a, a whole group, so I had to cut them apart. And in, when I lived in West Texas, we always saw vultures and crows and stuff just flying around looking for a meal so no, I, I thought neat. I'd like to do that on my layout. I rolled some footage earlier of the gears that you had built that it was a pretty neat little mechanism that you made to make the birds right. fly. Yeah it's uh, some servo link plastic chain and some cogs from their company and, and a gearhead motor. Okay and as we go around here it looks like this is a uh, shadow box design is the way you've really designed this layout where everything looks like it's a shadow box. Right yeah um, shadow box really helps you control the light it also helps keep your focus on the layout. Um, I don't like looking all over the ceiling when I see a layout. 
Uh, I like to see it more like, I guess, cinematography pano type shot, you know, where you, you get the whole spaghetti western feel, so. And as we go down here further, you've got this billboard that's smoking? That is correct. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat, neat yeah, setup. Yeah, it's based on a, a really famous advertising billboard that was in New York City. Uh, the gentleman actually that created it was in advertising. He created the whole mechanism and everything, how it worked, which was pretty amazing. You now I rolled, rolled footage of it earlier when it was blowing smoke and that was neat. And here's another example. I think this is the Bachman bus. I remember shooting this that product. Is maybe three years ago when it came out. Mine were super clean, not weathered. Of course, they were just product shots for Bachman. Right. But you've got it weathered and sound in it, and it's refreshing to see the model that way. Yeah, I, I added ESU Loke sound to it. I believe we put a custom program on it for it. I also added a bunch of people inside, give it a little bit of life. Just uh, a beautiful It's layout. a neat model. This is amazing. And the scratch built buildings and these freight cars and all of the, I saw the interior in the hardware store earlier that we were looking at. It's just a magnificent artistry that you thank have you. here, Gerald. Appreciate it. I'm glad to share it. Oh, Gerald, thank you for sharing it with thank the you. watchers of What's yeah, Neat. Thank you. And this is Gerald.
So the name of the show is What's Neat, and when I've got something neat, I've got to show it to you, and I just found something pretty darn neat. Now let's just say you wanted to build your dream layout. Say something around 2,000 square feet. What do you think it would look like? What would you imagine that it would look like? I'm standing here in a barn in the middle of Colorado with Kevin Rubel. You will remember Kevin Rubel as being the proprietor for Caboose, that hobby shop that we are all familiar with in the middle of this state. And Kevin, I've got to tell you what, you've built something here that has got my brain just scrambled. What, what have you done here? What have you built? Um, I've built, a, I built something that's, well, certainly from this benchwork standpoint, something you could jump on or or uh, sleep on and not have to worry about falling off because it's it's bulletproof. But I built what I what I'm building, what I'm in process of building. Um, originally was a model, basically switch for switch, of the Monon Railroad main line between State Line Indiana and Lowell Indiana in the, in the summer of 1967. At one point, I felt, particularly after I bought the store. I felt that, that was a little bit too ambitious and I might never get it done, particularly when I started thinking about installing 160 tortoise switch machines or building 411 kits. You know, I thought, there's no way I'll do this. I'll be spending the rest of my time How many hours kits. are in the day? Right, so I decided to scale it down a little, not in size, of course, because it's the same size, but scale the, the scope of the layout down. And uh, so I focused on the southern portion of the Monon Railroad between just south of Bedford, Indiana to uh, just south of Orleans, Indiana and the branch to French Lick, Indiana. That uh, doesn't involve any big 13 track yards. I think you've got a drawing over there. Let's go over and look at this drawing. I do have a drawing. A big drawing. It's a small version of it, a large version of it. Here, hold yeah. this microphone, Kevin, while I adjust sure. the camera and we're going to just work this together. Sure. Because that's kind of impressive. This is all drawn out. It looks like almost in half inch scale. Yeah, it's one inch scale, Okay. one inch to the foot. So the, the room is 35, a little over 35 feet by 53 feet long. And we have nice spacious four to five foot wide, well, mostly five foot wide aisles. And um, um, it's, it's, uh, it's just a simple single track main line, but it allows me, unlike the other layout, this will allow me to uh, operate um, 40 car trains past 40 car trains past each other and and operate the southern southern part of the railroad like the original monon was operated back in 67. so that's what we're looking at here all right and did i already ask you how many feet of track all the way around because i you know, see i see two major peninsulas and each one of these looks like they're an easy 35 or 40 feet right. long into the room yeah. and you've got some great aisle space here your aisles look like they're almost seven or eight feet wide. Yeah, in some, in some spots they are. This is really well thought out. Were you anticipating having more than just yourself operating this? Well, yeah, particularly when this was designed as, a, as the northern end of the railroad because it involved not only the, the Monon and the transfers all going into Chicago and then locals and road freights going south, but um, it also had trains of the Erie Lackawanna and the Nickel Plate and the uh, CNO, the South Shore, um, several different railroads. So, um, so I, I planned this for, for multiple operators. With the, being it's the southern end of the railroad, we'll probably be talking about six freight trains a day, and uh, two passenger trains, and uh, probably four locals. That's still, a lot still a few activity. trains. Still a few trains. But the only real yard on it is going to be the staging yard here. Um, the rest of it's going to be pretty much rural and small town 
Tell me about this bench operation. work. I see bench work's made of two by sixes, well, <laughs> and it looks like you're about 48 inches or 50 I, inches high. How was your height? 54. You know? That's 54. a perfect height. Yeah. 54, and then um, yeah, and it's in and the the sub bench work, as I would call it, uh, the 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 walls um, in, down the centers of the peninsulas, and then the bench work itself is all two by six and uh, two by four construction, um, two by six tilt up walls and. Uh, and, and that's overbuilt, uh, you know, I, I agree that's overbuilt, you know, the, some of my friends from the NMRA Front Range Division come over, they toured it once and they're like, well, this certainly is, certainly is sturdy bench work. Um, it's a, it's it is, it is. But, you know, it's, I, I have some experience building homes, I've built homes for quite a few years with, as a uh, volunteer with Habitat, as a uh, home leader. And so I, uh, I, I wanted to build something that would, uh, that would last, so. I love the height, I love the bench work. You've got your backdrops all painted blue throughout the whole layout we room. Do. So what is the linear, say that word for me, the yeah, linear, the, the, the length so the main line, of the backdrops? Right, right, so the main line, the main line run is uh, the same as it would have been for the other layout because it's, of course we, we didn't change any peninsulas or anything. So it's about 260, 200, Somewhere around 260 feet. 260 feet, man. You could run a lot of long trains on this. Yes. This is like, I am just foaming at the mouth. I'm ready to start <laughs> laying track with you I right now. Too. Let's just I go. Too. I mean, um, I but too. Kevin, I would look forward to an update on this in the future to see how oh, you absolutely. come along sure. with this project sure. because this is going to be one of those great model railroads. Thank you. I hope so. I think it'd be, it's going to be great to build. It's going to be fun to build. So. Um, well, thanks the, for letting me. Some time away from the thanks store. for letting <laughs> us just sneak up on you with a camera like this, just out of out Anytime. of the blue. We were just honestly, I was just getting to see it, and all of a sudden I turned on the camera because what I saw, I wanted all of us to see because this is inspiring. This is the beauty of the hobby is that you can just build your own world, just like Kevin has done here and is in the process of still doing. Well, and hopefully also proof that if you're in this hobby, if you're in this space as a business. It doesn't mean it has to, as some people often say, it has to kill your enthusiasm for the business. I'm more enthusiastic about building this layout than ever. I have less time to do it, but I'm way more enthusiastic about building it now than ever because I, I'm seeing people buy all this stuff for their layouts in the store, and I'm like, I'm going crazy saying, I gotta get up there and build mine. So. This is awesome, I hope this just came out. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. All of the model railroad products seen in this episode of What's Neat are available through Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado, or order online at mycaboose.com.